picture this. Midnight in a silent workshop. A brazier's glow licking the edges of iron plates. Threads of silk waiting like nerves. Lacquer shining like wet ink. By dawn, these parts will become a second skin. Armor built for rain, arrows, blades, and even bullets. Not a costume, a system. Forged iron plates sealed with Yurushi against Japan's merciless humidity. Rawhide and silk woven into shock-sharing lattices, and helmets shaped to trade weight for survival. Welcome to Japan Rewind, where we uncover the hidden truths behind samurai, castles, and legends of Japan. Stay with me because later in this video, I'll reveal the shocking reason why some suits of armor proudly carried bullet dents as proof of survival. Scales, silk, and weather. In the early centuries, samurai armor was lamellar, thousands of tiny scales called kozain. Some were made of iron, others hardened rawhide. Each was carefully lacquered in yurushi, layer after layer, until water slid off like oil. Rain, mud, humidity, Urushi was the shield against Japan's unforgiving climate. The scales were pierced and laced together with silk in a process called odoshi. From afar, it looked like decoration. Up close, it was structure, binding every scale into a living fabric. The uyoroi was the armor of mounted archers. Boxy, heavy, with massive shoulder guards, sewed, and a skirted cuirass. It gave formidable protection but limited movement, perfect for horseback duels. Foot soldiers began favoring the Dumaru. It wrapped closer to the torso, lighter, easier to run in. By the late Kamakura into the Muromachi period, Dumaru began to dominate. Because war was shifting from aristocratic duels on horseback to brutal infantry clashes. These armors shimmered like fish scales, rippling with every move. Warriors looked less like men and more like myth, wrapped in lacquer, silk, and steel. But beauty had its cost. Kozain armor took forever to make, and in the fires of the Sengoku Age, Japan would need something faster, stronger, and easier to repair. The big shift to Usigusoku, the 1500s, Japan was burning with civil war. Battles grew larger, deadlier, and technology began to shift the rules. In 1543, Portuguese traders landed on Tanegashima with matchlock muskets. Within decades, firearms spread like wildfire. By 1575, at the Battle of Nagashino, Oda Nobunaga's gunners, protected behind wooden palisades, tore through cavalry charges with coordinated volleys. The old lamellar suits, magnificent but fragile, were no longer enough. Enter Tusegusoku, modern armor. The key difference was in construction. Itazane, broad plates, replaced thousands of tiny kozane. Plates were riveted, hinged, or laced into panels. Armorers could build faster, repair easier, and create suits better able to absorb musket fire. The cuirass, or dew, gained larger solid plates and reinforced ridges. Sewed shoulder guards slimmed down, less show, more mobility. Helmets, or kabuto, became sturdier bowls of riveted plates, sometimes 32 or more, crowned with mayday crests. And there was influence from abroad. European cuirasses and kabase-style helmets inspired nanbandugu soku, Japanese armors borrowing foreign curves and rivet lines, but they were never mere copies. Armorers fused these ideas with Japanese aesthetics, lacquer, odoshi, meidate, making hybrids uniquely their own. By the 1700s, the age of plate had fully arrived. Armor was still art, but it was first and foremost, engineering for survival in the gunpowder age. Materials, iron, leather, and urushi, Every suit of armor was a collaboration of materials. Iron and steel plates bore the strike. Armorers preferred relatively low carbon iron, tough enough to bend under pressure rather than shatter. Leather, Nerigawa, was layered, hardened, and lacquered until it stiffened almost like metal. Indent deerskin, lacquered and patterned, added both protection and beauty to flexible parts. And always, Urushi lacquer. Applied in thin layers, each hardened into a waterproof shell. Urushi wasn't just shine, it sealed iron from rust, leather from rot, and made armor last centuries. That's why so many suits survive today, still gleaming, still strong. Iron, leather, lacquer, separate, ordinary, together. Alchemy, Odoshi, the nerves of the armor. If plates and lacquer were the bones and skin, Odoshi lacing was the nervous system. 
silk or leather cords, stitched plates into motion. Different odoshi styles mattered. Dense kebiki odoshi was beautiful but heavy. Looser shugake odoshi cut time and weight, leaving gaps that drained rainwater faster. Colors carried meaning, but not rigid codes. Purple often meant high status. Red, green, blue, tied to clan tastes, fashion, or symbolism. Whole armies shimmered like rainbows, odoshi gleaming under the sun. But odoshi wasn't just visual, it spread force. A strike on one plate tugged tension into its neighbors. Properly tied, the cords helped distribute shock across the whole suit. Finishing a suit required hundreds of meters of cord and hundreds of precise knots. Each one tied in sequence, each pulled to exact tension. One mistake and armor failed. Perfection meant life. Kabuto and schools. The kabuto was more than headgear. It was identity. Bowl-shaped, riveted from dozens of plates. The shikoro neck guard fanned outward in layered tiers. And above it, the Maydate crest, horns, antlers, suns, dragons. The Miyokan school dominated for centuries, their work prized by daimyo. The Sayotome specialized in helmets, famed for precise rivets and elegant curves. Their signatures became so sought after that forgeries appeared even in their own time. In war, kabuto shapes leaned practical. Fluted bowls deflected arrows. Thicker plates resisted matchlocks. In peace, creativity soared. Edo period parade helmets grew extravagant. Towering antlers, rabbit ears, even sea creatures. Symbolism mattered. A crest could intimidate, inspire, or signal lineage. Inside, silk or hemp padding spread the weight evenly, making even heavy helmets surprisingly wearable. Helmet as sculpture? Helmet as shield? Helmet as banner? Proof in the dent. Tameshigusoku. Here's the moment myth turns to reality. From the 16th century, armor wasn't just admired, it was tested. Tameshigusoku means proof armor. How? With bullets. Matchlock muskets fired point-blank into helmets and cuirasses. Armorers often left the dents, sometimes even inscribing the date and weapon used, a badge of confidence. Earlier, arrows may have been used to test plates, but in the gunpowder age, musket fire was the measure. Some proof-tested suits survive in museum collections, their lacquered surfaces scarred with one brutal round dent. Armor that had survived fire, and was now trusted for war. Imagine wearing armor already scarred before you. You marched into battle marked as proof, not shame. Proof your armor had tasted fire, and won. Protection versus mobility. Samurai armor was never invincible. It was balance. Every suit had gaps. Armpits, inside elbows, neck, thighs. Vulnerabilities weren't oversights. They were necessities. Without them, you couldn't move, draw, or breathe. Armorers weighed coverage against agility. More plates meant more safety, but also more weight. The due torso armor often carried ridged lines. They weren't decoration. They stiffened the metal and helped shed glancing blows. Helmets used the same logic. Raised lines strengthened bowls. Shikoro neck guards fanned to deflect cuts. The genius of Japanese armor wasn't invincibility. It was compromise. Armor that stopped arrows, slowed blades, resisted bullets, and still let a warrior fight like lightning. Cost and labor. So what did it cost? The truth, there was no single price. A campaign suit could be plain, practical, within reach of a lower rank samurai. A parade suit, gilded, lacquered, silk-laced, could cost a fortune. What united them was labor. Dozens of specialists contributed. Metal workers forged plates. Lacquerers sealed them. Silk weavers spun cords. Carvers shaped crests. Painters brushed clanmon. It could take months to complete one suit. Famous workshops like the Mayokin carried reputations so strong that daimyo waited years. Families sometimes commissioned armor for sons not yet born. By the Edo period, long peace turned armor into status theater. Daimyo flaunted elaborate designs, crests, and lacquer finishes. Armor became political costume as much as battlefield tool. Meanwhile, scavengers risked their lives on battlefields, stripping armor from the fallen to sell on the black market. Shogunal law codes punished theft harshly, sometimes severely, depending on value and domain. Time, skill, prestige, that was the true currency of armor. Donning the armor. Picture the moment before combat. The warrior begins with undergarments, hundoshi, 
Hadazuban, then Sunite Shin Guards, Haidate Thigh Guards. The Du wraps the torso. Sewed shoulder guards swing into place. Kote sleeves cover arms. Attendants work quickly but carefully. Every knot, every strap precise. Finally, the Kabuto lowers onto his head, chin cords tighten, the Maydate crest gleams. The process could take a long while. And when it was finished, the man inside was no longer just himself. Weight shifted to hips and shoulders, breathing muffled under iron. Vision narrowed to slits. He became heavier. Slower, maybe. But more than human. A walking emblem of his clan. Samurai described this feeling, armor didn't just protect the body, it transformed the mind. Fear dulled, duty sharpened. Inside the suit, they weren't individuals. They were the clan itself. Legacy of Steel. Today, samurai armor fills museums from Tokyo to New York. Look closely, you'll see centuries written in steel. Kozen scales from Kamakura, tiny, intricate, shimmering like fish. Plate do from Sengoku, solid, Ridged, built for bullets. Edo parade suits, gilded, colorful, more prestige than protection. Some suits are battered, scarred, dented, others pristine, lacquer gleaming. Both tell stories. What unites them is evolution. Each suit adapted, climate, technology, politics shaping every line, and that's why they captivate us. Because samurai armor wasn't just gear, it was culture, identity, survival. What remains today isn't myth of hidden flaws or mystical secrets. It's something greater. The visible legacy of generations of craftsmen, masters who turned raw iron, leather and silk into armor that was both weapon and artwork. Samurai armor was never just protection. It was survival in rain and fire. It was lacquer, silk, iron, engineered into beauty. From Kozain scales to bullet dents, every suit tells a story of war, of peace, of a culture balancing protection and pride. And when a warrior put it on, he transformed into a living emblem of his clan. So next time you see armor gleaming behind glass, look closer. Every cord, every dent, every crest carries history. If this journey into samurai armor fascinated you, hit like and subscribe to Japan Rewind. Drop a comment. What details surprised you most? And ring the bell because next week we'll uncover the shocking truth about ninja weapons that will change everything you thought you knew.